Good evening. It's time for us to begin our services. We have eight or nine pillows up here that if you're missing your favorite one uh, from the youth lectureships, they've moved them up here. So you might want to come and get, get your favorite pillow. You're visiting with us. We want to thank you for being here. You're our honored guest. Ask you to come back each time you have an opportunity to be with us. If you would fill out a card, uh, the green one that's in front of you and the bench in front of you, and just leave it on the pew and we'll pick it up after the services. We'd like to have a record of your attendance. If you have a phone or any other items that might uh, make noises or distraction during services, we'd ask you to please uh, silence those at this time. We got some good news about uh, Hal Hunt's uh, co-worker, Debbie Hansen. She's uh, went through the surgery and is this afternoon, we heard understand that she was doing well. So I want to continue to pray for her. Also continue to pray for the shut-ins that's listed in our bulletins. Uh, we uh, please look at those and send cards and call, phone calls to the shut-ins in our, on our bulletin. Today is the last day to pick up uh, elementary school supplies for the students here in our local East Ridge Elementary School. Uh, Paula Garrett is uh, heading that, and if you uh, have some uh, supplies or maybe some money that you want to give to her, do so, because uh, final day for that. Uh, Martin Boyd was able to have the uh, worship services this afternoon. And as far as they uh, know at this time, their COVID situation will let them continue to have a Bible study on uh, Wednesdays at 2 p.m. and Sunday afternoons at 3 p.m. Uh, listen to the announcements on Sunday mornings to be sure that that is able to be carried out. Chattanooga School of Preaching and Biblical Studies, first class will be on August the 22nd. Uh, the classes are on Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, and then uh, Denominational Doctrine and Isaiah. Kind of reminded me of uh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, uh, Roger saying you could teach a three-year-old uh, the Bible. Uh, we did that with our oldest daughter, Emily, and she loved it when she had got to say Joshua, Judges, Ruth, because it just ran together. Uh, so anyway, that's... Uh, just a story. Taking part in our uh, services this evening, first prayer is Rodney Jones, uh, closing prayer, Josh Perry, our scriptural reading by Alec Clark, and our song leading, Bob Garrett. Thank you. Scripture reading will be from the book of Romans, the book of Romans in chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18. Romans 1, starting in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as a God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the un uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. start with number 59. Number 59. Once again, if there are ever any songs you want me to lead or not lead, <laughs> just let me know. Drop me a note. Be glad to give it a try. Number 59. Come, let us all unite to sing.
to 35. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's a fair. pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day, for all the many blessings you give us. We know all things come from you. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, spread your message, and gave himself for the remission of our sins. Heavenly Father, we ask a prayer for those mentioned, and for those of our number that are dealing with medical issues, going through treatments, and different uh, things right now, and those that are shut in, unable to attend. Heavenly Father, we pray for them. And we follow, we pray for this congregation, for its members and its preachers and teachers and elders and deacons and song leaders. Pray that all things be done according to thy will. Heavenly Father, we pray for those in Ukraine. Pray this conflict can stop as quickly as possible. And we pray for our military and our first responders, Heavenly Father, and watch over them. We pray for these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. I want to mark number 125, that will be our song of encouragement. Number 125. And before the lesson, number 138. 138. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood.
I was listening to the announcements tonight. And if I understood Brother Reggie correctly, there's a heap of pillars down here. What that means is, if you come and sit on this second pew, you'll be really comfortable. So come on down, okay? Come on down. If you have a Bible tonight, open to the book of Colossians. I won't call it a warning, but I'll call it a notification. It's our intention in the next three months, August, September, October, to preach through the book of Colossians in 10 lessons. The last Sunday night of each month, uh, we don't have a, a lengthy lesson like this, so that will work out. That's the plan. So uh, we're going to put a title with each of the lessons. We're going to uncover every verse. The Bible indicates that the God of heaven is the God of hope. And God affirms that his people are people of hope. And so tonight we're going to look at that portion of chapter 1 which deals with hope. And so we're simply calling our lesson tonight, Sermon Number 1 from Colossians, People of Hope. And the text we'll be using, there'll be four, five consecutive verses and then a couple of others. I want to begin in verse 3 and go to verse 7, and then we'll drop down to verse 23, and then verse 27. Now, God willing, next week in our second lesson, we're going to study another aspect of chapter 1. That's the plan, okay? Verse 3, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints. Verse 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth, as ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Then verse 23. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I Paul and made a minister. And then verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so again tonight we're calling our lesson People of Hope. Life when, when folks are looking at what lies before them, as they look at certain circumstances in life, if they conclude there's not much hope, or if they conclude in this situation there's no reason for us to have hope, that's quite depressing. But God's people, though we face challenges and trials, into this passage tonight. Now, just to make sure that we're on the same page, according to verse number two, this is a message, a letter written to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae. Colossae was a city. The book of Revelation was written to seven congregations in Asia. Colossae also was in Asia, meaning in modern day times that would be in the, west, the western portion of the nation of Turkey. That's what Colossae was. It was a city. And as you read this letter, Paul writes as one who's in chains. He, he's a prisoner in Rome. He knows about their circumstances, but you, you get the feeling that maybe he's not been there before or they don't know one another. So I want to work through the text and we're going to get to the hope aspect in a moment, but notice if you would in verse number three, as Paul often does in his letter to Christians, 
He expresses this idea. Paul, what's going on in your life? Well, Paul could give a lot of answers to that question. But here in verse number 3, one aspect of Paul's life was prayer. And the portion he says here in verse 3 is, we give thanks to God. Christians are thanksgiving people. We don't just have a sense of gratitude. We express that gratitude. And we'll see that idea Throughout the book of Colossians, over in chapter 3 and verse 17, we do all in the name of the Christ, giving thanks. Not just feeling thankful, but expressing giving thanks unto God and the Father through Him. Well, specifically in this case, for what was it that Paul was giving thanks as it related to the saints in Colossae? Well, again, verse 3, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith and your love. And so in this case, the specific item or the specific issue for which Paul's giving thanks, he's thanking God for the Colossian Christians, for what he's heard about them. You and I would have an extensive list if we were to try to write down item by item all the blessings which we have in our lives. You know the old song, count your many blessings, name them one by one. We would say, good luck on that one. may even be one of those deals where you finish your list tonight before you go to bed and you wake up in the middle of the night and you get, I I said, I got five things. I better write them down what I'm thinking of it or I'll forget. We are a blessed people, right? God gives to all men life and breath and all things. And Paul was thankful. And you know, when a person shows gratitude, that rubs off on other people. But there's a second aspect before he gets to the hope. And that is, what do we know about these Christians in Colossae? Well, we learn from verse number 4. He says, we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all the saints. Let me tell you this, y'all. That's not a bad thing when a congregation is known far and wide for its love and its faith. There is a letter in the New Testament that was penned to one person. And that book is that I have in mind is the book of Philemon. Yeah, you guessed it, written to a man by the name of Philemon. And in that letter, in chapter 1, the only chapter, in verse number 5, Paul Paul says, we're hearing of your love and faith. And so it's the same items. When Paul thought about the church in Colossae, he said, we've heard about your faith and we've heard about your love. When he makes mention of this man Philemon, he says, we've heard about your faith and we've heard about your love. Now here's an interesting thought. I want to mention as a possibility, perhaps a probability. Where did Philemon abide? Where did Philemon live? Remember the the book of Philemon, the thrust of the book of Philemon is about a runaway bond servant by the name of Onesimus. Well, here's the thing. When Paul wrote the book of Philemon, he said, I'm getting ready to send Onesimus back to you. Where where did Onesimus hail from? Look in your Bible in Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, verse 7, he talks about sending a fellow by the name of Tychicus. And then verse 9, he mentions with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is... What's that say? One of you. So it certainly sounds like at the time Paul's writing the book of Colossians, which was the general same time period when he wrote the book of Philemon because he's a prisoner at both times, it sure sounds like Onesimus was from Colossae. And if Paul was doing what he said he was going to do, send Onesimus back to Philemon, 
and Onesimus is going to Colossae, then it sounds possibly, probably, most likely, where did Philemon live? In Colossae. So you put those two ideas together. What Paul has heard about Philemon, his friend, good friend, he said, Philemon, I've heard about your faith and your love, Philemon, verse 5. Now when he writes to the church at Colossae, what does he say? He said, I've heard about your faith and love. When a congregation is on fire for the Lord, and it's oozing with faith and love. When, when that faith and that love is on display, that catches people's attention. It catches the, the attention of people in the community. It catches the attention of the teenagers in the congregation. It catches the attention of the visitors to the public assemblies of the congregation. It catches the attention of those four and five year old kids who get drugged to services every time the, the doors are open. It gets people's attention. Not for the purpose of impressing, but it gets people's attention. And so when you think about the church in Colossae, obviously they were not perfect people in the sense of being sinless but they have this foundation of faith and love. And when you've got a foundation of faith and love, great things can happen. Now, let's get into the hope. Verse number five, for the hope which is laid up for you. Now, Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount about laying up, what? Treasures. Laying up treasures in heaven. And according to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 5, there was hope laid up for these folks in the same location. The hope which is laid up for you in heaven. It sounds like the language of 1 Peter 1 and verse 3, that it's reserved, right? You've been begotten again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance which is undefiled, fades not away and it's reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. So throughout the new covenant, you see this connection. The hope that we have is connected with heaven. So our hope is not on earthly things. Our hope is on heavenly things. And when Paul wrote a, a letter to a man by the name of Titus, a Christian brother named name of Titus, he spoke about being in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised for the chapter 1 and verse 2. Hope always looks to the future. Hope is always about something that's good, and in the Bible, the Bible nails it down. Our hope is the hope of heaven where we will have eternal life. Now, how is the gospel... How is the great news of salvation through Jesus connected with the hope that the Christians in Colossae had? How is the gospel connected with the hope that you and I have? Well, let's just kind of walk through the text here, beginning in verse 5 and going to 7 and pointing out some things about this hope or the gospel. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel... How did they learn about the hope of heaven? According to verse number five, they learned that through the message of the gospel. Yes, the gospel includes the fact that Jesus died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose from the dead. But according to verse five, the gospel also includes the hope of heaven. So how did they learn about such a hope? And the answer is, they learned that through the gospel. In fact, in verse number five, it's, it's described as the truth of the gospel. Well, when you know that the source of the gospel is none other than God himself, it's not a shocker when you read about the gospel being a message of truth. It's the truth of the gospel. On the night that Judas is carried betrayed Jesus, Jesus spent a lot of time that evening with his apostles, doing a number of things, but one of the things he did in his message that night was to comfort them and encourage them because basically he said, I'm going away, but the spirit of truth, 
The Holy Spirit, the helper slash comfort, when he comes, he's going to guide you into all truth. But I want you to reflect on that thought. Jesus described the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth. Not a spirit of falsehood, not a spirit of confusion, not a spirit of a mixed up mess, spirit of truth. And so when you read here in verse number five, it's the word of the truth of the gospel, that's what it was. They had hope that was revealed in the gospel. They had hope because of the truth. And verse number six, he says, which, which what? The gospel is come unto you. I think the King, New King James uses the past tense, which has come to you. Question, how did the gospel get to Colossae? Jesus didn't go there in person. How did the gospel get to Colossae? There weren't any local radio or television stations. Somebody took the gospel to Colossae. And when that happened, according to verse number six, it came to them, but not only unto them, it had come into all the world. Now we'll speak more about that when we get to verse number 23. But look what the gospel did when it got to Colossae. And bringeth forth fruit. The, the gospel resulted in fruit in Colossae. Now in the New Testament, as I understand it, there are at least two kinds of fruit which the gospel produces. Not one kind, but at least two categories of fruit. Jesus spoke to his apostles and said, lift up your eyes and look unto the harvest, for the fields are what? White unto harvest. So there's that idea, and he went on to talk about you sow and you reap. And in that context there in John 4, he's not talking about sowing wheat seed or barley seed. He's talking about sowing the seed of the gospel. And one of the terms that Jesus used to talk about the crop is harvested, he used the word harvest. He used the word reap. And he used the word fruit. There in John 4, verses 35 to 38. So in that connection, there is a sense in which the gospel produces fruit when people hear it, believe it, and obey it. you got yourself a new Christian a new follower. That, that's a kind of fruit. But that's not the only kind of fruit that the gospel produces. Another kind of fruit is the fruit about which we read in verse number four. It's not called fruit in verse four of Colossians one. It's called faith and it's called love. Another type of fruit the gospel produces is Christian character. And both of those had resulted in Colossae as a result of the gospel getting carried to that city. Fruit was born. People obeyed the gospel. They were born into God's kingdom, into God's family, and they were demonstrating faith and love. We go on in verse number six. And bringeth forth fruit as it does also in you since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. The gospel was a message of grace. It was a message of hope. It was a message of truth. It was a message of fruit. It was a message of grace. In fact, there are times when Paul, in describing the gospel, calls it the gospel of grace. Translation, the good news about grace. God is the God of grace, gives a message of grace, telling us that by grace we can be saved. And then verse number 7, in connection to the gospel, as ye also learned of Epaphras, somehow... Epaphras was one of the communicators of the gospel. Either before they became Christians to produce that fruit or after they became Christians or both. But Epaphras was one of the individuals who was involved in teaching the gospel to the brethren at Colossae. And as a result of that effort, these are now people taught by people of hope about God's hope and now they're people of hope through the gospel. Now, they start out as new creations. 
they come out of the water of the creek or the river or whatever after they're baptized into the Christ, they've got newness of life. They are hope-filled people. But there's a condition that's stated in, in Colossians 1 about what's required on our part in order, in order for us to genuinely have that same hope of going to heaven. Now drop down to verse 23. You see we're making progress. We're on verse 23, right? Verse 23. If, there's your condition, if ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. If they're going to maintain hope, they've got to continue in the faith. That is a lifelong project. You know, there's this picture about which we read in the New Testament of running a race, right? And we're to run that race with patience or endurance. Hebrews chapter 12 and, and verse number uh, 1. Or in Hebrews 6 and verse 11, we're to hope unto the end. The condition in Colossians 1 is continue in something. What is it? Continue in the faith. Not simply to keep on believing. That's certainly part of the formula. But here is the concept of continue in the faith. Well, there's one faith, right? Ephesians 4 and verse 5. One faith. And, and that that one faith often is depicted as the faith. For instance, in Galatians 1 and verse 23, we read that Paul said, the people who had not yet met him or seen him since he became a Christian, he said, they've heard about me. And he said, what they've heard about me is, the fellow who used to destroy the faith now preaches the faith. Now, if we weren't studying tonight in Colossians 1, and I weren't up here yapping about this, and I just ask you the question, no trick question, what message did Paul preach? We said, we preached the word of God. He preached the gospel. Well, in the language of Colossians 1 and 23, the gospel is called the faith. And so when you and I look at verse 23, if we want to maintain our hope, you don't need a good psychiatrist. You don't need somebody to get up and motivate you with some kind of powerful lesson. What you and I need is to continue in the faith. And then the other side of that in verse 23, and be not moved from the hope of the gospel. When you read that, do you conclude that it's possible for a child of God to be moved from the hope of the gospel? The answer is yes. Yeah. If it's not possible for a person to be moved from the hope of the gospel, then it makes no sense for Paul to say, make sure you're not moved away from the hope of the gospel. You know, the devil, he can pull and he can plead and he can push, but he can't force us to take that step. He can't force us to abandon the hope of the gospel. If that ever happens in my life, and preachers are not immune to that, if that ever happens in my life, that is 100% on me. It has nothing to do with the government, has nothing to do with the environment, has nothing to do with my parents, has nothing to do with my friends, that is on me. And so Paul's message is, if you want to keep on having the same hope, and I know you do, number one, you continue in the faith, and number two, don't be moved from the hope of the gospel. Now then, there's an aspect of the gospel in this hope we read in verse 23, and that, that's this. And, and I'm not adding words to the text. I'm simply making a conclusion based on the text. Paul said that this faith or the gospel, look in verse 23. Again, let me read the whole thing. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. You know what I conclude from that verse? Every person in the world needs to hear the gospel. Yeah. The folks in Colossae 
had been blessed beyond measure because somebody communicated to them the gospel. And Paul said, you, basically, you can write her down. He was writing in the years 61 to 63 A.D. And he said, the gospel's been preached to every creature or in, in all the creation. And there's been a debate through the years. Was Paul, when he talked about the gospel being preached to in verse 23 and also in verse 6, the gospel's come in all the world. Was, was Paul speaking about only the Roman Empire, which would have been known to his writers, or was he talking about the whole world, the whole globe, as we know it? Well, well, I know this. When Jesus was teaching the apostles, when he was speaking to them the week of his crucifixion, and remember that when they were leaving the temple, one of the apostles remarked, basically, well, this temple's amazing. And Jesus said there's coming a time when there won't be left two stones, one on the top of the other. In other words, he said, this temple's going to be utterly destroyed. He said, but before that happens, he said, before that happens, the gospel's going to be preached to every, in all the world. And he said, the gospel's going to pre be preached in all nations. Now, that's Mark 13 and about verse 10. And Matthew chapter 24 and about verse 14. So, so in the words of Jesus, before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, he said the gospel is going to get to all nations and it's going to get into all the world. I tend to think Paul's talking about all the world, all the world. But that, that doesn't take away anything about what lies before us today. We have a planet today that's not limited to the Roman Empire. It's not limited to the geography of the USA. We have a world today that's populated with, and we were talking about this morning in class, per near 8 billion people. I was telling the students this morning, it's kind of mesmerizing. You get on one of these websites, and it's got one of these clickers that keeps showing the population going up. And every second is clicking. You say, well, yeah, but there's people dying. Well, what's happening is every minute, every second, every second, more people are being born than are leaving the world through death. So every second, there's an increase in population. So it's right about 7.96 billion. This is just an aside. I promise this is not a rant. It's a plea. Okay? There's a difference. I was reading a bulletin article yesterday. Good bulletin, great congregation. And the writer was talking about evangelism. And he said, well, the world's population today stands at 5 billion. Now, it could have been a misprint. If it was, it needs a better editor. But if it wasn't a misprint, then that was a written a long time ago article. Okay? The world's population hit 3 billion in the fourth year of my life. In 1960, the world's population hit 3 billion. And it went from 3 billion to double that in 1999. So in 1999, the world's population was 6 billion. So here I am reading a bulletin article in the year 2022, and the message is there were 5 billion people at the time I read. So he wrote that thing a long time ago, or else it was a misprint. Now, we haven't gotten to it yet in our class. Downstairs, we're, we just started studying the, we're studying the church, and we start talking about the work of the church in evangelism. One of the questions in that book that we're going to be talking about is, number one, what is the current population of the world? We're going to answer that. And then the next question gets really personal. Not, not to cause anybody to be embarrassed. I'm asking myself the same question. Whether the world's population stood at 90,000 or 8 billion, it's still the same question. And the question we're going to talk about coming up in our class downstairs is, what plans do I have? What plans do I have to help get the gospel to every person that lives on the planet Earth? Somebody said, well, you can't go everywhere. That, that, that's absolutely true. One person is not possible to teach everybody. That's absolutely true. The church in Colossae was blessed 
because somebody went and communicated the gospel. Now, what I affirmed a few moments ago, probably so long ago, you can't remember. 23, I conclude if the gospel is going into all the world, every person needs the gospel. I want to know why. Why do people need the gospel? Well, they need the gospel because it'll make them a better person. It's true, the gospel makes people better people when they submit to it. But there are a lot of things in life that can make a person a better person have nothing to do with their eternal salvation. People need the gospel because of sin. And God has one remedy, and next week we're going to talk about that remedy being the blood of Jesus. And the gospel is the power of God into salvation. Okay? So it becomes our role, not our burden. Not our burden. It becomes our role to be communicators of that gospel. Now then, drop down to verse 27 as we're really heading toward the finish line. Verse 27. Paul's been writing about something called the mystery, the fact that Jews and Gentiles could be saved in the Christ. Verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, comma, what does that mean, Christ in me? The hope of glory. Your hope of eternal salvation, my hope of eternal salvation, is because of what Jesus did on the cross and because of the Christ being in us. That is the hope of glory. When Paul wrote the book of Galatians. He said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ lived in him. Ephesians 3 and verse 17, Paul's appeal for the Christians in Ephesus was that they would live their lives in such a way that Christ would dwell in their hearts by faith. That's how the Christ dwells in our hearts. When we learn the gospel and we choose to live by faith. Now, let's wrap it up by asking this question and giving a, a quick answer in review. To whom or what, to whom and to what did the saints in Colossae owe their hope? You want to fast forward to the year 2022 for you and me? To whom and to what do we owe our hope? And as we've worked through the text tonight, one of the things we've seen, they are hope, we owe our hope to the God of heaven, right? The Father planned it, the Son paid the price, the Spirit revealed it. We owe our hope to the Godhead. You take the Godhead out of the picture, there is zero hope for mankind. Number two, they owed their hope and we owed our hope not only to God, but to God's gospel. That's how they learned about hope. That's how they learned what to do in order to receive that hope. And number three, they had hope, and we have hope, not only because of God and God's gospel, but because of God's servants who teach the gospel. I was biblically ignorant. Well, I knew there's something called Moses. I didn't know. But I'm thankful that people didn't give up on me. I'm thankful people didn't say, well, this moron is a hopeless case. They taught me to help get me out of darkness. To whom or what do we owe our hope? To God, God's gospel, and God's service. Don't let anybody tell you this world is a place where there's zero hope. That's not true. If you're walking with the God of heaven, you have a hope that leads to something out of this world. From this day forward, the the society in which we live, it may head in a good direction. It may turn worser. I know that's a bad word. It may turn worse. But that has nothing to do with whether or not you and I have hope. Because our hope is not in a party represented by a donkey or an elephant. Our hope is in the Lamb. That's the one in whom our hope is found. And so we sang tonight, my hope is built on nothing less Brother Bob has selected a song. And in my book, that is song number 
125. If you're here tonight and you're a child of God and you need the prayers of the saints, let us know. We'll pray with you and for you. you Maybe here tonight and you've never obeyed the gospel, but you believe Jesus is the Son of God. And you're ready to repent of your sins, confess your faith, and be baptized. God will add you to His church and nothing else. If you become a part of something else, God had nothing to do with it. God had saved people to His body and nothing else. If you need to respond, would you come as you stand and we sing? Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with Him?
447. 447, you can come forward and be served below the supper. 447. King of my life, I crown thee now. I shall the glory be. But lest I forget thy thorn brown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Christians represents the body of your son Jesus as it hung on the cross at Calvary. Father, let us take of this in a manner well pleasing in thy sight. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Again, Heavenly Father, we humbly bow before thee. Mindful Father of the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary, and Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which, which to us as Christians represents that blood, Father, let us take of it in a manner well pleasing in thy sight. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. time to give. Father, we thank thee for the blessings of this life, the material things that we have in this life, Father. We are mindful of the funds that are used to do your work here and throughout the world. Father, we pray you'll bless these funds as we give. And Father, we pray you bless those that are giving. In Christ's name, amen. Let's pray. Dear God, we are so thankful to have had this day, this time of worship, so we could uh, gain more knowledge about you, so that we could spread your word to others. We are so thankful to hear about those who have been healed from sickness and those who have had uh, surgeries and other things that have gone well, and we hope that they are able to get back to their lives as normal. We ask that you be with all those who uh, are mentioned as sick, that uh, you be with them, that we can do it for them as we can here. For those who are in need, those shut-ins, that we can um, be the kind of Christian that we're supposed to be. 
uh, to them and to help them as we can. Please be with us as we leave from here tonight and help us to uh, continue to portray ourselves as Christians and to uh, always do your will to put others first before ourselves. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.